So I've got quite a few videos on my channel talking about Earth's history. I even have my longest hour-long video about how we reconstruct Earth's history and study past conditions on Earth. But I've also occasionally got the question, why do we study Earth's past? Why do we need to focus on things in Earth's past rather than just studying Earth's present? Why are we spending money on this? Well, Earth has a 4.5 billion year history before humans even came on the scene. We study past climate, oceanography, and geology on Earth to create a global picture of conditions during each period in Earth's history throughout those 4.5 billion years. There are entire fields devoted to studying Earth's past, that is paleontology, paleoclimatology, paleooceanography, my field of research currently, evolutionary biology, paleoecology, paleoseismology, archaeology, stratigraphy, which is the study of layered sediments and rocks and how those came to be and what conditions caused their formation, historical geology, which is a lot of the things I talk about on my channel, things that happened in Earth's history, dendrochronology, studying tree rings and their implications for past climate, etc. I mean, a lot of these, there's a lot more that I didn't even mention, and a lot of these have a lot of overlap. The point is, there's a lot of fields that are devoted to studying Earth's past, and people devote their entire lives to this. Institutions and government organizations fund a lot of this research, but why? Why do we spend time and money to study Earth's past? Well, the short answer is the past is key to understanding the present and future conditions of Earth. Understanding modern physics and physics processes, chemistry, geological processes, biology, astrobiology, looking for life on other worlds and how it might have come to be, relies on our understanding of, one, how Earth and other planets in our solar system and moons in our solar system formed and how Earth's orbit and tilt and rotation have changed over time. With this information, we can model potential future perturbations in Earth's orbit, tilt, etc., which can give us an understanding of potential future climate and biological trends due to such perturbations. And it also helps us determine what other planets might be physically, due to their formation, their position, etc., habitable for potential life and where we should explore in terms of space exploration. Whether we're looking for life or potentially economic mineral resources. Our understanding of modern physics, chemistry, biology, etc., also depends on, two, how Earth's chemical composition developed and what governed our planet and the other planet's composition during formation. This information provides us with a basis for understanding modern Earth chemistry and chemical processes, how the chemistry on Earth evolved over time, and that allows us to model future chemical evolution on Earth and how that might affect life and other Earth systems. And this also provides us information about what other planets or moons might be chemically habitable based on their composition, what chemicals they have available that life might be able to exploit. Our understanding of modern physics, chemistry, biology, astrobiology, etc., also depends on three, how atmospheric and oceanic chemistry has evolved through time and their controlling factors, what factors have controlled this evolution and affected this evolution through time. This provides us the basis for understanding global geochemical or biogeochemical cycles which sustain life. I talked about biogeochemical cycles, well, in a few of my videos, but one recent comprehensive video that I did about how microbes are really important, I'll link up to the top right if you're interested, but basically they're heavily controlled by how the atmosphere and ocean exchange chemicals with each other and with life and how life transport these chemicals through our systems and all of that. So these cycles, I mean, the only way we can really understand how they've evolved through time and how they're currently operating is by studying how ocean and atmospheric chemistry has evolved over time. This also provides us an understanding of how life, especially humans, might impact atmospheric and oceanic chemistry and how that might impact climate based on how it has in the past and the mechanisms and the chemistry that we see operating today. 
our understanding of modern earth and planetary science and future earth and planetary science also depends on four, how continental and oceanic crust composition and positions have changed and evolved through time. Continents have not always been around. They formed early on Earth through processes that I talk about in, I think, this video, I'll link it to the top right, I don't remember what it's called. Um, and they've been shifting and moving due to plate tectonics throughout time. And a lot of this tectonics and early formation has heavily affected their composition and oceanic crust composition and oceanic composition and atmospheric composition and all of these things. Um, and atmospheric and oceanic circulation, depending on the continental positions, mountain belt positions, etc. And understanding how these things have evolved over time gives us an idea of how they've affected climate and other Earth systems over time and helps us to understand what's beneath us. Understanding the composition of Earth's crust and the distribution of elements throughout Earth's crust is the basis for exploring for things like fossil fuels and economic deposits. It also helps us understand natural disasters and how they've happened in the past, what caused them in the past, what effects they had in the past, and how and where they might occur today and what effects that might have. This also helps in addition to number three, the chemical composition and evolution of the ocean and atmosphere through time. This number four, the composition of continental and oceanic crust through time, also helps us understand nutrient cycles and elemental cycles that sustain life on Earth and how they move through these different systems, not only the atmospheres and the oceans, but also the geosphere, how chemicals can be locked up in rocks and then re-liberated from the rocks later and what processes cause that and have caused that in the past and how that might affect other Earth systems like climate, life, etc. And how perturbations in our continental crust or oceanic crust chemistry might affect life. And the last or fifth factor that our understanding of modern Earth and planetary science relies on is five, how life has evolved through time. This provides us an understanding of how life on modern Earth came to be and how long that took and the processes it involved, which can be used as a basis for understanding how life on other worlds may have come to be, how long that might have took, and what chemicals and physical conditions that might have necessitated. It also provides us a better understanding of genetics, how genetic mutations get passed down depending on environmental conditions and changes over time, and how diseases might spread and evolve as well. For example, COVID viruses. So those are like the five major factors that our understanding of modern earth and planetary science rely on. However, I'm going to focus on a few significant examples to dive a little deeper into here, just so I can get a little bit more in depth and specific with examples of why earth history and studying earth history is important for understanding these concepts. So the first one, climate change, we'll talk about why studying climate change events in Earth's history is so significant for understanding modern climate change. Evolutionary biology, why understanding how life has evolved on Earth is so significant for understanding modern biology and life processes. Natural disasters, how studying natural disasters in Earth's history is really important for understanding and predicting and predicting consequences of disasters like these on modern Earth. Earth resources, how we find Earth's resources purely based on our understanding of how rocks there in that region came to be and what they might be composed of and what they might hold. All of that exploration of economic deposits and such is relying on our understanding of Earth history and geology. And planetary science, how understanding Earth history is significant for looking for life on other worlds. First things first, climate change. Climate change is something that has occurred throughout Earth's history. Um, however, today it's often used as a term to describe the modern, the current climate trend going on um, on modern Earth, which is largely driven by human activity. Hence, YouTube, who, you know, because I say the term audibly climate change in a lot of my videos, including this one, they'll probably have a little disclaimer pop up at the bottom of the video, which they put on a lot of my videos. Anytime I say climate change, they put it on there. Um, but basically the disclaimer or whatever says climate change is long-term temperatures, weather patterns caused mainly by human activities, blah, blah, blah. Um, they're not wrong in terms of 
when we're talking about modern climate change, and that term is often used to refer to modern climate change. However, it is kind of wrong when they put it on a video where I'm talking about climate change 30 million years ago or 200 million years ago. So, you know, whatever. But anyway, <laughs> that's why um, that disclaimer can be wrong because the terms can be used differently sometimes. In any case, the question often comes up that if climate has been changing constantly through time, why are we so worried about modern climate change? Well, to answer this question, we have to understand a little bit about the causes and effects of past climate change events. So for example, whenever rapid climate change has occurred on Earth, rapid relative to the gradual change in temperatures and climate over time, this tends to correspond with an extinction event. Some smaller than others, but there have been five big mass extinction events or recognized mass extinction events in the past 550 million years throughout the Phanerozoic Eon. This implies that the current climate change trend might have a similar effect because it is a little bit more rapid than the typical general trends that um, occur gradually over time because humans are inducing more rapid climate change than would be occurring naturally. And when we look at extinction levels from the past several decades in comparison to those that occurred likely in the extinction events that are shown here, we see that history is kind of repeating itself. So a lot of scientists have begun to call our current climate change event the sixth mass extinction because extinction levels have significantly risen in the past few decades due to uh, the current rapid climate change event. However, Earth's past and the past extinction events that have happened throughout Earth's history are not all about doom and gloom and <laughs> extinctions and that's it. Actually, we see that feedback mechanisms, in other words, climate trends that occur due to a particular climate trend that can tend to balance it back out or bring climate back to normal after these intense rapid warming or cooling events tend to lead to a great recovery of life after each extinction event. If we look at Earth's past and the big five mass extinction events that we listed on the previous slide, we see that life recovered after every single event to most of the time a level of diversity that was much higher than pre-extinction event. So technically if an extinction event happens on Earth, it's not like Earth ends. It actually <laughs> kind of leads to life that's more resilient in those conditions and then diversifies greatly after the fact because a bunch of ecological niches just opened up for those organisms to take over and diversify in. By studying the feedback mechanisms that bring back balance during past climate change and extinction events, we can use this to try and offset our current climate trend. For example, the albedo effect. We know that feedback mechanisms that involve albedo can very strongly affect climate. Albedo just refers to Earth's surface reflectivity. Wider surfaces like snow and ice reflect a lot more solar radiation leading to a cooler Earth uh, compared to darker water or continental rock surfaces, which absorb a lot more solar radiation and thus heat Earth a little bit more. Some ideas regarding using albedo to our advantage involve things like like making roofs white or other surfaces whiter or lighter so they reflect more solar radiation and cooler surface. Ocean fertilization is another idea basically involving fertilizing the ocean so that we induce photosynthesis and algal blooms at the ocean surface, which induce carbon burial. Basically, they take up carbon dioxide to photosynthesize and they convert it to organic carbon, their bodies, and then they sink to the seafloor, become buried, and store that carbon in the geosphere and rocks long term, decreasing atmospheric carbon dioxide over the geologic timescale. Now, I talk about that at length and why it might not be such a good idea in the video, which I'll link up to the top right. Um, but that's another idea based on our understanding of past uh, feedback mechanisms that have brought back balance. Um, No-till farming is another one. Basically, soil can store, will sequester and store a lot of carbon uh, from the atmosphere. And that kind of the same concept as the ocean fertilization can lead to decreases in carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere and, and greatly um, store it long term in sediments and soil. Um, and tilling seems to decrease soil's ability to do this. And so if we do more no-till farming, it could theoretically lead to a lot more carbon sequestration and storage in soils globally. Planting trees is a really popular one. 
Obviously, they photosynthesize, therefore they take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, decreasing atmospheric carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. However, it's, unless very large scale, not the best method because one, trees only photosynthesize half the time uh, during the day. At night, they respire, releasing carbon dioxide. Two, they die and become decomposed um, and often are converted right back to atmospheric carbon and therefore don't do much. The things like ocean fertilization and no-till farming suggest more long-term geosphere storage of the carbon rather than just short-term sequestration and then releasing it back. And finally, induced weathering. Induced weathering, I don't have a graphic here, but basically it involves us increasing continental weathering rates, often by scattering weatherable rock fragments over places that get lots of rain, and that induces their weathering, chemical weathering, that dissolves their constituent ions, transports them to the ocean, and the calcium ions, carbonate ions, might get reprecipitated in shallow sea environments as calcium carbonate, or IC, in organic carbonate carbon storing the carbon long term in the geosphere again. So all of these ideas come from our understanding of how they've occurred in the past to rebalance out warming trends. But in addition to the effects of climate change events in the past, we can also look at what has caused past climate events to get a better understanding of what's causing our current climate trend and how we might go about mitigating that. For example, past global climate change events were typically, for the most part, caused by great perturbations or disturbances to Earth's carbon and oxygen cycles. Earth's carbon and oxygen cycles are kind of intertwined very closely because things like photosynthesis and respiration um, kind of cycle those two things back and forth. Uh, the respiration animals and stuff release carbon dioxide, which plants use to produce oxygen, which feeds the animals, which produce carbon dioxide, and so on and so on. So when one of these cycles gets out of balance for any reason, the other also does. For example, we can see how important the carbon and oxygen cycles are in Earth's history if we look at the big five mass extinctions that I mentioned earlier. The first two, for example, were caused by climate change due to plants spreading over land. Land plants had just recently evolved and then took over the lands, which were previously just rock with a little bit of bacteria, archaea, and fungi. This spread of land plants drastically changed the carbon oxygen cycles globally because the widespread photosynthesis over land and soil formation and increasing continental weathering greatly increased carbon burial or decreased atmospheric carbon because all the plants were taking up the carbon, the soils were forming taking up the carbon, and continental weathering was taking up the carbon. This led to major global cooling, which led to mass extinctions. The later three mass extinction events of the Big Five were caused by global warming, typically triggered by either massive volcanism, impacts, or both. Volcanism and impacts both drastically increase carbon in the atmosphere uh, because Impacts tend to burn a lot of material upon impact, and when that happens in a carbon-rich sediment environment, that material releases a bunch of carbon. It also sometimes induces volcanism and wildfires, which just burn more carbon. Volcanism also releases a lot of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and therefore both of these processes can cause major global warming. This is analogous to the effect of humans burning fossil fuels, which releases carbon just like volcanoes and impacts and leads to warming. But based on past climate change, we see that magnitude is not so dangerous. A great magnitude of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, for example, is not super harmful. In fact, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been way higher in Earth's history, particularly in times of great diversification and wonderfully healthy ecosystems. However, it is actually the rate at which climate changes that tends to be the very detrimental or harmful thing. Rapid global warming or cooling is more harmful to life than a gradual warming or cooling of the same magnitude. Again, I've talked about this in previous videos, which I always mention warming versus warmth. It's important to remember that the rate of the current warming trend is the thing that is really worrisome about causing mass extinction. The ultimate warmth that we will reach or ultimate temperature we will reach 
wouldn't necessarily be harmful to life on Earth if we had gotten there or were to get there gradually over millions of years. Life evolves over millions of years to current conditions on Earth, so the fact that conditions change quickly, whether it be warming or cooling, can be detrimental, whereas if they change gradually, life can adapt. Studying these causes and effects of past climate change leads to better climate models. It also can help us better distinguish between natural cycles versus human impacts. For example, natural interglacial cycles of the current ice age that we are in right now. Understanding what's interglacial warming versus what's human-caused warming is really important, and studying past climate cycles and climate trends and perturbations can help us distinguish those processes. Moving on from climate change now to evolutionary biology, basically studying evolutionary biology and paleontology using fossils, biomarkers, biosignatures, and genetics provides us really important information about the origin, evolution, and extinction of species on Earth, how genes get passed down and expressed, which can help us understand the evolution and the spreading of viruses, which is really relevant to today, and it can help us understand the future of biological evolution and how life might have evolved on another planet or moon given its conditions and its chemical and physical evolution to our understanding. Earthquakes and other natural disasters are another reason why studying Earth's past is really important. Earth's past holds critical lessons about when, where, and how natural disasters occur and what effects they might have. Ancient sediment deposits and fault lines can show us where the occurrence of things like earthquakes and other disasters has happened and the intensity of such events. I actually, fun story, did an internship with USGS, the US Geological Survey, right after my undergrad in 2019. I was with the natural hazards group, so of course that's what we were focused on, and the group that I was with studied specifically paleoseismology, the study of ancient seismic events, which I had no clue that was a thing. I thought we just had seismology, like how do you study ancient earthquakes? You're not there. But we can see preserved in the rock record ancient fault lines and where they've slipped and how much they slipped and even estimate the rate at which they slipped, which gives us an understanding of you know, when they occurred cyclically through time in that region, when they might occur again along that or other faults. And it's just incredibly cool the way we can learn these things. This helps us greatly to understand and prepare for natural disasters today and design better infrastructure. <laughs> Next, we have Earth's resources. Basically, if we didn't know how Earth's crust formed and how it got to be the chemical composition that it is and the distribution of different rock types throughout Earth's crust and how they've gotten there, we would not be able to find fossil fuel deposits, economic and metal deposits, or groundwater, which is really important for water resources, which is becoming very you know, limited in some regions, me speaking from El Paso currently. So all of this is really important and it all relies on our understanding of how these things got there throughout Earth's evolution. With this information, we can estimate how much of these deposits are present, where they came from, where they're concentrated, and how much we can sustainably use. Last, we have planetary science. Basically, Earth's physical, biological, chemical, and geological evolution is what provides us a basis for understanding other worlds, especially those that might represent Earth at an earlier or later time. For example, Earth's impact craters and geological structures and understanding how those formed and evolved help us to interpret those structures on other worlds. Also, geochemical signatures in our rock record that indicate past climate on Earth allow us to study to some extent the climatic evolution of other worlds by studying similar geochemical signatures and first off understanding what they mean on Earth and then extrapolating what they might mean on other worlds depending on how that other world's you know physics and chemistry works to begin with. And of course the potentially most intriguing is biosignatures preserved in Earth rock provide us 
the go-by, kind of, for searching for similar or Earth-like life on other worlds. So I could go on for hours, probably, with many, many more examples of why studying Earth history is super important and funding worthy. <laughs> I've had to do it for enough funding proposals that I know how to pitch it now. Um, well, I don't know, maybe you guys will tell me in the comments that it was a horrible video and I pitched it all wrong, but I think, I guess those are my favorite reasons why studying um, Earth history is really important. But um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you can think of any other reasons that I missed and you'd like to discuss in the comments, please comment down below. I'd love to know more. That'll give me more food for thought for future proposals. So, <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much. And with that, guys, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.